Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a 357 caliber uh, Automag Model 160. Now the standard Automags, which were manufactured through the 1970s and into the early 1980s, and which have also very recently come back into production with a new company, those standard guns were made in 44 AMP, which is a cartridge that was essentially 44 Magnum without a rim in a self-loading semi-automatic pistol. Well, one of the things that they added to this product uh, fairly early, like December of 1971, this was announced by the original Automag company, was a caliber conversion unit for 357 Automag, or AMP, where simply what they did was take the 44 caliber cartridge and neck it down to use a 357 diameter bullet. So one of the cool things about the Automag pistol is that the, the whole upper assembly, the barrel, and barrel extension are very easily removable, and so what they made were gun kits, essentially, where you would get uh, a complete firearm in 44, and then also an extra barrel assembly in 357. And you could just interchange the barrel assemblies and shoot either caliber with the same base gun. That sort of thing is still done today, for example, with 9mm and 40 caliber, or 40 caliber and 357 SIG, or a bunch of other combinations. But this is, uh, well, and this is also often done on the large Magnum automatic pistols. The LAR Grizzlies have interchangeable caliber systems, the Desert Eagles have interchangeable caliber systems. This is not an uncommon thing. But what makes this unusual is the cartridge itself. So. 44 Automag was always a difficult cartridge to find commercially. It was basically the realm of handloaders. Well, 357 Automag was completely the realm of handloaders. Uh, Automag themselves never sold any ammunition for it. Uh, Norma, who did make 44 AMP, never made any 357. The only commercial operation to ever produce it was Lee Juris, uh, company Supervel, which made a little bit of it here and there. But really, this is a cartridge that's entirely in the realm of hand loading. And so there's almost no standard specification for it. If you look in most reloading handbooks, you won't find data on 357 AMP. You can load it, uh, you could load bullets up to 180 grain, you could load bullets down to something like 90 grain. If there is a single standard, it's probably a 158 grain, standard for 357 Magnum, which in this pistol would be running conservatively at about 1500 feet per second, pretty easily bumped up to 1600 or 1650, especially with a long barrel like this one. Uh, now if you took an 8 or a 10 inch barrel and you decided to drop the bullet weight down to say 125, you could easily uh, hit 1800 feet per second. And if you wanted to get really crazy and drop the bullet weights down to something like 90 grain, you could exceed 2000 feet per second. Now the gun has kind of stopped being really all that reliable below 140 grain bullets. You have a lot of changing dynamics on the pistol when you start getting into these you know, exotic hand-loading territories. But um, I digress a bit. Let's take a closer look at this. Let me show you how the barrels interchange and give you a closer look at the cartridge. From the factory you basically had two options for barrels. You could get a six and a half inch vent rib barrel, or you could get an eight and a half inch non-ribbed barrel with just a front sight out there. The eight and a half tended to be the more common choice uh, for silhouette shooters. This was uh, a popular use of the Automag during the 1970s and 80s was uh, pistol silhouette shooting. And then for, for that purpose the power was a, a fantastic advantage to have, and the very long sight radius that you got with the eight and a half inch barrel was uh, of definite benefit. Now in order to swap barrels around we're going to leave the magazine in the gun. We're going to go ahead and lock it open like so, and then I just flip this lever down, and then slide the other barrel right on, flip the lever back up, and you're good to go. Now here's our assortment of cartridges. We've got standard plain Jane 357 Magnum for a revolver here, we've got 44 auto mag here, and this is our 357 auto mag. So the overall length of all these cartridges is essentially the same. And this one is simply 44 necked down to use a 357 size bullet. 
Now I've talked about how this is a cartridge that has to be hand loaded, it's worth also pointing out that this is not a beginner's hand loading project. There's a lot of nuance and subtlety and care that has to go into hand loading 357 AMP. Um, it's a bottleneck cartridge which is odd. The guns are basically all handmade guns. Uh, yes they made like 9,000 of them, but they were all made in small batches and they were all basically hand fitted together. If you get a box of automag parts, they you may have every part from a gun, but they won't necessarily just drop in and fit together and work. They often require hand fitting. And part of that is that the chambers aren't all always exactly the same. So brass made for one specific uh, Automag 160 may not work in every other Automag 160. It may be too long, it may be too short, you may have head spacing issues. These are some of the things that come up with 357 AMP. Uh, another example of something you could have to watch out for, depending on what sort of loading you're looking to do, is jacket separation. You can, if you use a lightweight bullet, you can get a uh, projectile from 357 Automag going fast enough that uh, the bullet will be spinning so fast when it leaves the end of the barrel that the copper jacket will actually separate from the lead core of the bullet and go winging off, off to the sides. Uh, typically if that happens like you then often have the lead bullet itself disintegrate uh, in midair. It's, it's not a good thing. Uh, you're not going to hit a target if your bullet literally disintegrates before it gets where it's trying to go. So issues like that. Um, are, are a factor with 357 Automag. What we have here really is a pistol and cartridge combination for someone who is truly dedicated to this particular system. This is not a beginner's gun, this is not the sort of gun that you go pick up at the local gun shop because you see it in the you know on the counter and it looks cool and you take it from the gun shop straight to the range and, and put a hundred rounds or a thousand rounds through it. This is a gun that requires uh, tinkering and experimentation and building your own logbook on uh, load development, deciding what exactly you have this pistol to do. Is it for handgun hunting? Is it for silhouette shooting? Uh, is it simply for ballistic experimentation? All these things are valid reasons and they're all reasons uh, that people have gotten automags, especially 357 caliber automags. In total about 9500 automags were manufactured between 1971 and 1983. I don't have access to the factory records from all of the different factories that produce these guns, but a uh, collector estimate is something on the order of 20 to 25 percent of them were made uh, in 357. And remember that you could also buy just barrel assemblies. So not every gun in 357 today started off as a, as a complete 357 gun. Some of them were just extra barrels. Um, but there are probably about 2,000-2,500 of these floating around various places. Um, a lot of them have kind of been snapped up by collectors more so than shooters because they are kind of the exotic cool extra that's rarer than the standard guns. So they're a little harder to find on the market than the original production would necessarily lead you to expect. Anyway, a big thanks to the viewer who loaned me this example to show to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.